Good afternoon. I'm Steve Ross. On behalf of the American Finance Association, I welcome you to the latest in a series of interviews with founding contributors to the academic discipline of finance. I'm pleased to report today that my interview with is, a is with a longtime personal and professional friend, Richard Roll. Did you have any idea when you did uh, Pharma Fisher Jensen Roll, did you have any idea how important that would become as a paper? Was it clear to you that that was an important piece of work? Or? No. I had, I had no clue. In fact, when I first saw the results of the paper, you know, Mike Jensen and I were working on the computer, and this graph, which has become famous, came out of this, of what happened to the price prior to the split, and then I thought, I thought we had an error in our computer program. You know? <laughs> so I spent nights you know, trying to debug the thing, and then I finally realized that it had to look like that because markets are efficient. You know, then we realize what what it had to look like. So, um, Did, but I didn't. I didn't think events. I didn't realize event study would become such a widely used technique. You know, there are thousands of papers and that have used it since then. But um, yeah, I, it's clearly yeah. the the workhorse of econometric work in finance yeah. in some way, mm -hmm. and still to this day very trusted. I think. Yeah. Uh, while you were there, you also worked with Gene on uh, the stable operation distributions and some right. properties mm -hmm. of distributions. Can you tell us something about that work? And well, st they're, they're a family of probability distributions which have particular uh, properties that seem to make them fit stock prices and other asset returns better than more standard distributions, which are normal distributions or similar. And the difference between these a normal and a stable law is that the stable law has higher probabilities of extreme events. So uh, this this has got a lot of application in finance because we see these very, what should be very unusual events happening, such as the crash of 87 or the, what happened this past year in the market, should not happen if returns follow some more standard distribution. There's too much, there are too many events which happen that are extreme. Was that, it an effort to explain those extreme events that led you to that research? Yeah, yeah, because the, the remember Gene wrote a paper called Mandelbro and the Stable Operation Hypothesis when he was a student. Mm -hmm. And Mandelbro, Benoit Mandelbro, was the guy that really tried to popularize these things. And we were trying to add to the statistical literature. The papers that I wrote with Gene were really ways to fit the distributions, to estimate the parameters and you know, use the data to try to see exactly which member of those stable families were the best description of the of the print. They were empirically oriented, but they were theoretical in the sense that they were methods for fitting the distribution. Well, that seems to me to characterize a lot of your work. There's a methodological component, and then there's a a portion that really deals with the data and the issues at hand. Mm -hmm. And the first comes about as a method for getting to the second, usually, and that came through in. Uh, the paper on the behavior of interest rates, or rather the book you wrote. Now that was a monograph from your thesis, I guess? Yeah, it was my thesis that was written, it was published as a monograph and was submitted to that uh, for the Irving Fisher competition and won. Mm -hmm. That's a competition in economics. Uh, Paul Samuelson wrote the foreword to that, to my book, you know, which... Uh, I remember. Remember? Quite an honor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As you look at the at what's happened to interest rate research going forward, uh, were you surprised at the turns it took, or did you think it sort of follows naturally from that original work? Well, well, there, the, there are two. I think there were two kind of milestones in my mind uh, about this. One is the literature on interest rates and inflation, uh, and probably the most important paper there was a paper that Fama wrote. Uh, back in the early 70s, uh, where he kind of turned the equation, the Fisherian equation between nominal and inflation around and fit that better. And the second part of the evolution was this continuous time models, which you had a lot to do with, developing interest rate models to fit continuous time interest rate models using modern kind of derivatives approaches to doing that. Uh, uh, those are the two, I think, main things that have happened since I was, and I never would have anticipated either one of those things when I worked in my thesis back at Chicago. Yeah, yeah. after Chicago, your successful uh, foray into the academic world as a graduate student, 
You got your first job at Carnegie Mellon. Do you recall your earliest impressions of going to Carnegie as an assistant professor? Well, I couldn't see it, but there was too much smoke in the air. <laughs> the steel mills were still uh, belching out, and Carnegie Mellon was actually right next to a big steel mill on the Allegheny River, which uh, the smokestack stuck, stuck up right next to the campus. And, uh, uh, but it was, Carnegie was an interesting place. I, I was exposed to people at Carnegie that I never knew about before at Chicago, people that were like Herb Simon, who were quasi-psychologists. and Because you know, Carnegie uh, Mellon actually had within the department, it had psychology, economics, everything was all in the business school at Carnegie Mellon as well. So there were a lot of fairly unusual people, including political scientists and people like that that I got to know. There were some great economists there too at the time, yeah. I guess. There were a few, yeah, pretty, pretty good guys like Bob Lucas and Ed Prescott, <laughs> you know, people like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about your interaction with those guys, particularly those two that you mentioned, because there's a lot of discussion about efficient markets and finance, and there's a lot of discussion about rational expectations and macroeconomics. And did you guys have discussions about that? I, I did very, very much with Bob Lucas. In fact, I, I have to, I have to think, and I think he thinks that, you know, a lot of our discussions led to some of his most famous papers of rational expectations in macroeconomics. You know, when he won the Nobel Prize, he made a point to come out and talk to me in, about this and about our old days at, at Carnegie. But yeah, we were, I, you know, I, those guys were not that aware of efficient markets ideas uh, before I went to Carnegie. And so we did have, we had a lot of talk about that. Although the guy, the first guy that did rational expectation was a Carnegie guy, Jack Muth, yes. remember? Uh, yeah. Yeah. But efficient markets, I think, went kind of beyond what he had mm -hmm. in mind. And, uh, but it led to the rational expectations uh, ideas, too, in, in macro. Now, you were at Carnegie for five years, from 68 to 73. Yeah. And then you spent the next three years in Europe. How did that come about? I thought I needed to change the scenery, so I moved to um, Belgium. There was a research institute in Brussels called the European Institute for Advanced Study and Management. And um, they offered me a, a position, so I went to I went to that research institute, and I spent two years in in Belgium, and uh, the second of the two years, my current wife came over to Europe, and we were together, and she brought her children from her marriage with her. Mm -hmm. She got a divorce too, Susan, and uh, then we were there from Belgium for one was one additional year. And then I moved to France. I took a job at HEC, Haute Etude Commerciale, which is the grande école in France for commerce and economics. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you came back to the, to the States, you took a job at UCLA, and you seem to have settled into this job fairly well. Yeah, well, my, my wife Susan didn't want to move to California. She said there were too many blonde divorcees and stuff around here. But <laughs> uh, I said, well... We're going to have to do it anyway, so she agreed to come along. And uh, after we'd been here for about four or five weeks, she said to me one morning, "I'm never going to leave here." <laughs> <laughs> Is that why <laughs> you stay here? <laughs> no, it's not. Why. I like it too, but uh, but I, th I think it uh, shows you how how uh, you can get used to living in Southern California. So, have you ever been tempted to take another offer or try another place? I've had other offers, but I've never been tempted to, mm -hmm. to really to try it. Uh, I did move. I did move to New York for a couple of years on leave from UCLA and lived in the when I worked for Goldman Sachs. Uh, so I spent two years in Manhattan, but I never really left the university because I was just on leave from there. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Since you raised it, that's uh, you were the head of mortgage-backed research and one of the founders of the mm -hmm. department there. Uh, what did you think of your experience at Goldman? Oh, I love Goldman Sachs. I, I still do. I mean, the people that, that I met there, several of them are still some of my best friends. Uh, Tom Lasserson, Marvin Kabatsnik, and I worked um, very closely for two years with a guy that's been in the news a lot, John Thane, uh, who was, as you know, he was became president of Goldman Sachs and then head of the New York Stock Exchange and then head of Merrill Lynch and then fired by Bank of America. <laughs> Did John work for you at Goldman, or you worked? No, together? he worked. He worked with me. He we, he was in the mortgage securities department as I was, and we were basically working together on all kinds of projects. But I mean, he did. He was originally an investment banker, 
And so the Mortgage Securities Group did all the mergers and acquisitions for thrift institutions as well, because mm -hmm. we could value all the assets. So he, he was working on that. And then we also worked on uh, originating collateralized mortgage obligations. We invented strip mortgage-backed securities. Uh, you also were the first to analyze IOs, interest only. No, that's what it was. The, the strip mortgage-backed yeah. security were the IOs and POs. We did the first eight deals that were ever done on IOs and POs um, in 1986, I think it was. And was it the academic side of or the intellectual challenge of doing that that excited you, leaving aside the question of the personal relations with the people? Was it the intellectual challenge that excited you? Well, there was an intellectual challenge because because mortgage-backed securities are pretty complex instruments, and so you have to use a lot of modern finance to value them properly. Uh, and I did. I tried to apply everything that I could from 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 the finance community, from the academic community, to try to build models to value. Because you know that we're trading them. We're, we're we're trading them every day, so we had to have some idea of what each security was worth. And so we had to construct these valuation models for those, which depend a lot on the embedded options and the mortgages, as you know, the prepayment mm -hmm. options and default options. Mm -hmm. And if they're adjustable rate securities, they become more complicated because they're linked to some interest rate that has some stochastic process, which is which you have to model. And so it was. It, it's, it's pretty interesting work. And I did publish, you know, maybe seven or eight papers mm -hmm that had some of the research that I did there, which is proprietary, but later we, you know, became commonly used, and so we published papers about the stuff. You know. In the light of this background, does that give you a perspective on what's happened in the recent years with the mortgage market? And Yeah, well, I think I understand what, what happened. <laughs> they, Could you explain started... it to the rest? <laughs> <laughs> well, the subprime, the subprime situation is very easy to... Explain you loan money to people that, that can't afford to repay it, uh, and not surprisingly, if the housing market doesn't keep going up, they won't repay it. Uh, and it the mortgages you were dealing with were agency issues that didn't have default. Well, we did whole loans too. Mm -hmm. We we did we did we did mortgages backed by Freddie and Fannie and Ginny. Those are the kind of the kind of the plain vanilla products. Mm -hmm. We package those to do collateralized mortgage obligations, which is the precursor of collateralized debt obligations, which mm -hmm. recently have had all this trouble, all these tranches. Although, you know, when I was doing collateralized mortgage obligations, every single one of them was a triple A security, and they mm -hmm. never had a single problem mm -hmm. uh, in any of them. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, you, you see what's happened now in, in the mortgage market is that, especially in the subprime market or in the all day, Basically, they're underwriting loans, which um, they never would have underwritten. So it's a fall in underwriting standards. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're lending money based on projections of future housing prices that turned out not to be correct, right? Now, let me return to academics and very parochially here. In 1980, you teamed up with this fellow, Steve Ross, to publish the first empirical investigation of arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, why'd you do that? <laughs> well, because he invented the theory, <laughs> so I thought it'd be a good choice to uh, try to test it. And I proposed that we we do that, and he said, "Yeah, that sounds like a good idea." I, I think see, uh, I seem to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> now you followed up with the paper with Naifu Chen. What was the purpose, from your perspective, of that paper? What was the one that Naifu and you and I did? Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in, in the first empirical paper that we did testing arbitrage pricing theory, we, we, did, we used uh, a technique where we didn't have to identify what the underlying true factors were. Okay? We used factor analysis to do that. Uh, and so everybody was always asking us, well, okay, factor number one, what is factor number one? What is factor number two? And stuff like that. So we thought of a way... Why don't we sit down and think theoretically about what the factors should be, mm -hmm. macroeconomics, and see if we can find some empirical support for that. that so that's, that was the genesis of that idea. I still don't think it's necessary to identify the factors. You know, I think we can work fine just with un without naming them you know, and get a very good result from that. But people don't seem to like that idea. One of my favorite papers, going back to this theme of small stuff, one of my favorite papers is your Orange Juice Futures paper. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that, how you came upon that, and 
Well, yeah, the, uh, it, it was a, the, the genesis of that idea was to, wait, was to try to test market efficiency where the underlying information was truly exogenous that comes from nature. And so it, I thought about this for a long time, and then I was talking to my mother who was living down in Orlando, Florida, and she was telling me about all the orange juice that's produced in Florida. I looked it up, and, and I discovered that almost something like 95% of all the orange juice is in the whole country is produced in a small area in central Florida. So I, I realized that the weather in that rather small contained area is going to be a principal driver of what's going to happen to the prices of orange juice. And there's a futures market in frozen concentrated orange juice. So what I did is I, I got the data from the futures market and I, and I related that to the weather events happening in that small area. Orange juice is one of the only things you can do this with because if you take wheat or you know, soybeans or something, they're, they're all over the country, but in the case of orange juice, you only have the weather in that one region that matters. Well, if there's a freeze in central Florida around Orlando, the price of orange juice just goes sky high because it's going to be less supply of it. But then I thought, well, let me turn this on my head, on its head. Why don't I see if the futures market can forecast the weather? Because it should. People in the futures market should be able to predict when there's going to be a freeze in the orange juice. And they should, they should bid the price of orange juice up prior to the freeze actually happening. Right? And so I ran it in the opposite way. I got the forecast from the National Weather Service of these freeze events and stuff in central Florida. And I looked at the orange juice market to see that the market could improve on the weather forecast. And it could. So the market, the frozen concentrated orange juice market, actually had better weather forecasters than the National Weather Service. What did and the National Weather Service think of this? They result? didn't like that too well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, the, the data speak for themselves, as you said before. Right? One of the most surprising results from that was that having given this fulsome description of how all that really mattered was the weather, you then discovered that something else was going on too. Sure. There's a lot of fluctuation in the price of orange juice that's not uh, caused by the weather. Um, and that's kind of a puzzle. The behavioral people have picked that up as an example of kind of unexplained phenomena. Because you know, you would think that the only thing that would matter for orange juice prices would be the weather that affects the supply in central Florida because, you know, the demand for orange juice is not going to change very much from day to day. And I actually looked in the paper about substitute things like apple juice and Diet Coke and stuff like that, and that doesn't have any impact on it. So, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of fluctuations in prices which are just inexplicable. Uh, I don't know whether that's because people get harebrained ideas and go to the market and start trading for no reason or what. But there is a lot of unexplained volatility. So that led to your, your talk on R-square yeah. and some work with Ken French on volatility yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that. If there's all this noise, why can't we make money from it? Well, it's unpredictable noise. You, don't, you, you know that it's going to be volatile, but you don't know whether it's going to go up or down. So you, know, you can't really make money unless you know the direction that it's going to go. We talked about a number of your papers. Is there a particular favorite we haven't talked about? Well, you didn't talk about my paper on the asset pricing test. Is that I the... left that for you to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell us something about that? Because that was a truly revolutionary piece of work. Yeah, it was a paper that I wrote uh, when I was in France, actually. Um, I, there were, prior to that time, there had been a, several empirical papers by Black, Jensen, and Scholes, and by Merton and Scholes about testing the Sharp Lintner Trainer model of capital asset pricing. Uh, and I thought those papers were pretty good. And I uh, was thinking about it though when I was in France by myself. And I'd come home in the afternoon and Susan would make me a great dinner, you know, and I'd think about it some more. And then one day in my I remember I, I discovered this, this incredible th fact was that. It didn't matter which portfolio you picked. If it was a mean variance efficient portfolio, the betas and the mean returns were linear functions. And I thought, 
my God, this is such a fantastic theory. It works even when you don't even <laughs> you pick any old portfolio. That was my first thought. That this is just fantastic theory. And then it dawned on me, but wait a minute. If it works for anything, you know, it's, it's a tautology, right? So I started thinking about what these tests really implied. And uh, then I realized what they were testing was just whether or not a particular portfolio was on the efficient frontier. And I also realized that there are a lot of ways that kind of test can go wrong. It doesn't, you, you might make two kinds of mistakes. It might be that the, the portfolio is really not on the efficient frontier, but by forming portfolios of assets rather than using individual assets, you wipe out that mm -hmm. discrepancy. Or, you know, it could go the other way too. So, mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the theory really says that the market portfolio is on the efficient frontier, but the market portfolio is unobservable. So, you know, I was claiming in the paper, well, you can't test something that's unobservable, right? That's the only, that's the only re reasonable test. So, uh, that paper had a profound effect upon the way people think about things. Uh, profound. But what always troubled me was it had a profound effect on the way they think about them, but they still kept doing the same thing. Yeah. It, it is amazing. <laughs> you know, still today, with, you know, 30 years later, people are still running the same kinds of models, you know, but uh, it's, it is pretty amazing. Uh, that brings it to a close. The okay. AFA wants to thank you for your time today, and mostly okay. they want to thank you for your many contributions to the field. Thank you. Thanks very much.